about where everybody is in the world and whether they're sleeping or awake. My son is actually living in Hong Kong now, so it's very much on my mind, that 12-hour time difference. Okay. And just some more images over time um, that I've taken in Hong Kong over this 12-hour time period. You read about it in some of the early literature. Nicole Constable did one of the first books on Philippine migrant workers in Hong Kong, the first ethnographic study, and um, other, other regional researchers had commented on this too. And in, in the old days, um, the congregation of uh, women on, and some men, 10% of them are men, on their time off would be around this place called Central, which was a bus station uh, over the harbor from the Kowloon side and the Hong Kong side, and there's a ferry back and forth, so it's, it's uh, around the uh, ferry terminal. And <clears throat> I went there and it was raining. It was raining and I just was so moved because people were huddled under umbrellas and I thought this is their only social time. It's their only time where they can be themselves, meet with their friends. And, and I actually ran into two women I knew and I, I sort of got to learn a little bit more about the meanings of that. And um, it, that process continues until this day. People have cardboard spaces that they make to, to make a little sort of almost domestic-like intimate space where they can be with their friends, there's buying and selling of local products going on, there's many things. And um, same story, 2017, only here. <coughs> We've moved the site a little differently. The old ferry terminals pulled down and replaced, but they're still in that same neighborhood, and it's a place of luxury shopping now. So there's this incredible juxtaposition of... Uh, the wealth and then you know their amazing contributions to the wealth of the city. You can see here, rain, shine. There's parts of the city, there's been big debates in the city over their presence and there is a part of the city now where they've stopped the traffic to allow them, where I took that first slide with the mobile phone seller, to allow them to have some space for themselves and um, uh, there are some, there's a shopping mall that allows them to use the uh, facilities there, the toilets and so on. Um, but it, there have been debates about stopping them congregating altogether. So it's, it's a, a slightly fraught process. Okay, so. <clears throat> <clears throat> to go back to uh, neoliberalism, I just want to mention that there's a lot of discussion in anthropology and other disciplines about neoliberalism and some of it is poorly done. Much of it is poorly done. There's a lack of definition and there's a sum an assumption in the writing that it has the same qualities wherever it's applied and I think it's our job to, to specify what we mean by neoliberalism and how it applies in the context that, that we write about and um, nor, I think, should we, as George Barker has argued, treat it as a radical break or a rupture. Some people speak about it as if it's a whole new thing. And in fact, neoliberalism has, is just an iteration, more of the same but with a slight edge in terms of managing capitalism and uh, the movement of, of people and capital and goods around the world. And as you know, it's, it's very much tied to uh, neo, to market processes and this <coughs> idea of the free market. Let the market adjust things, let, let people enter the market freely as individuals and so on. And one of the things that is a new twist about contemporary neoliberalism as it is shaped, it, certainly on the Canadian side, is this notion of individualism, ind the individual subject um, sort of being free to operate, um, you know, to their advantage. And of course, we, you know, this idea, the promise. So a lot of our students are being sort of encouraged to think of themselves as entrepreneurial, as entrepreneurs, as individuals, you know, and it is true that that kind of subjectivity and that kind of set of practices may be necessary 
But it's also important that we understand that it doesn't need to be like this. You know, um, Keynesian economic theory is still a theory uh, of social redistribution that some people are arguing, you know, was a was a, a better way of doing it. So, um, and of course, as you might know, in terms of um, labor export countries such as the Philippines, a lot of those countries are countries that are in debt. And so their debt management regime is imposed upon them by uh, agencies like the IMF and the World Bank. So, so they too have to um, restructure what goes on inside those countries uh, relative to neoliberal dictates. So in this article, that is part of the entanglement that I'm talking about. The way Canada's immigration program was restructured and how that fits with our Philippine uh, changes in its labor migration, labor export policies and the entanglements back and forth. So the paper's quite complicated because we go from sort of a historical discussion in, in both context very briefly you know, through to the contemporary situation, which has um, a whole set of uh, rapidly introduced changes in, in Canada um, that people in the Philippines have to adjust to. Now, central in the Philippines context, um, I've got a section here on um, the history history of Philippine labor export, which has accelerated, and ironically, the huge ironically aspect of class politics around surrounding migration in the Philippines is the way in which um, the anti-migration or migration advocates have constantly um, advocated for better, better policies and, and some of them to stop migration altogether. So you have this activism around migration in the Philippines, which has produced, actually, ironically, a firming up of labor export policy. So the government says, OK, so we're going to make better regulations. You know, We're going to, to, to take better care of our migrants. Um, these things came to a head um, with uh, the post-Marcos government uh, with the um, Ramos administration where there were a couple of sensational um, circumstances where two migrant women, one in, one in Singapore and one in the United Arab mm -hmm. Emirates, um, experienced tragedy. The woman in Singapore, Sarah Balabagan, was um, executed for a robbery that many Filipinos felt she didn't actually commit. And Sarah Balabagan in the UAE, the UAE was... Um, supposed to be executed for stabbing her employer who uh, was attempting to rape her and they were going to execute her but there was such a massive outcry globally and it turned out that she had um, changed, she was much younger than she was supposed to be to leave the country. So um, Sarah Balabagan was flogged and then eventually were jailed for a while and then repatriated and after that moment, Philippine labor export policy was never the same again. Ramos was in an election mode for his re-election. He put a lot more stringent regulations in place. He put a number on the, on the number. We want to get a million a year. The Commission for Filipinos Overseas became more active, trying to keep in touch with uh, migrants. Now, the Commission for Philippine Overseas only works with permanent migrants. It doesn't attend to the temporary migrants. So, you know, if you go to the website, there's all these happy stories of migrants living abroad and so on, and they do annual conferences. I've been to some of those conferences. Now, and you should also know that it's not the case that Philippine migrants are ever who they seem to be. Because migration has been going on, well, for a very long, long period of time, and because the countries Filipinos migrate to have a long history of the reception of migrants, and they're in over 190 countries, many migrants plan 
their migration way ahead of time. Families plan, um, individuals plan, they get educational, um, they get educated, and they educate themselves with a view to a particular location that they want to travel to. And typically, in my research over the years, I have seen migration socially reproduced in the next generation. So somebody leaves, they work abroad, they work very hard, they work in successive labor contracts, they send money home, somebody gets educated and that person then picks a destination and goes to that country. So we're seeing migrants go with better and better for qualifications, but not necessarily better and better jobs. They're often working at a, at a job level that is lower than their skill set and their educational qualifications. I've written about this and I've riffed on an idiom value plus plus because when I was first in the Philippines when you would buy something, I'd, you know, how much is this? Oh, it's, you know, 500 pesos plus plus and the plus plus.